Hello and welcome to Brokenomics. Now in this episode, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by author, uh, comic and commentator, Scott Adams. Scott, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so Scott, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because obviously Brokenomics, we, we talk about a lot of economic stuff on here and broken systems and all that kind of stuff. But there's a kind of consistent theme in the books that you've been producing over the years, which is kind of the economics of the self, you know, maximizing the value that you can bring and sort of having the right mental attitude, approaching things in the right way. Have, have, I, have I got that about right with the way where you're coming at this stuff? Yeah, I'm kind of famous for several completely different things, but one of them is that I do a lot of writing on the personal success. So, and mm. I take the uh, take the point of view that if you get your economics right, you know that's going to be one of the biggest parts of your personal success. It's not the whole thing. So, yes, you're you're correct. So, so what what does that look like for an individual? If you're a young man today, how should you um, apply yourself? Well, I've got two books that are relevant to that, How to Fail Almost Everything and Still Win Big, and then the new one, Reframe Your Brain. And in both of them, they talk about uh, building a talent stack. So that would be the number one thing. And what that involves is starting with whatever you have a natural inclination for, or maybe a little bit of talent for it naturally. And if you like that, seeing if you can add other talents on top of it so that you're special. So I'll give you the, the, the cleanest example is if you're a worker at some company and you, uh, let's say on your own, you learn to do public speaking. Well, when it's time for the promotions, if you've got the ability to stand in front of the crowd and, and motivate them and talk to them and others don't, you're kind of the first choice for a promotion. That's just a simple example. In my example as a cartoonist, um, I'm not the best artist in the world. Most people can tell that. And I'm not the funniest person even in my town. But there aren't many people who learn to draw and also learn to write humor and also had some business background, so I had a topic to write about. So I took fairly ordinary skills, but because they're combined in a way that are rare, uh, that allowed me to have a high economic value. So I teach people to look for what skills they can combine with what they already have to become special. And then... Then the second big theme is systems being better than goals. A goal, everybody knows what a goal is. But the problem with a goal is that you feel like a failure the entire time until you're lucky enough to reach the goal. And then a weird thing happens in the current times. You could put a bunch of energy into reaching your goal only to achieve it and find out it's obsolete or it doesn't make sense anymore because everything in the world is changing as you're going. So having a specific goal makes it very unlikely that by the time you reach it, it's still the best thing you could have been doing or, or aiming for. So instead, a system, as I define it, is somebody who's doing something every day that increases their odds of good outcomes without over-specifying it. So going to college for a lot of different majors, this would be true. You're making yourself more valuable in a variety of ways. You don't know where it's going to go exactly. So that would be a a better strategy than having a specific goal for, for most people. So th those are the big things. There's lots more. Okay, so let's say I'm working at the widget factory and my goal is to become, you know, the head of the widget department. How do I turn that into a system to, to make that more useful to me? The first thing you do is get rid of your goal because you could, in fact, succeed and become the, the head of the department. But by the time you got there, you might be asking this question. Wouldn't I have been better to change jobs entirely to another company? Or am I even in the right field? So if you've got a system that makes you capable for not just that one job, but for a variety of things in different fields and maybe even different jobs at your same company, that gives you the most options. So, for example, going back to my original, if you had learned uh, public speaking, maybe some business, uh, business you know, knowledge, business management, uh, if you uh, knew a little bit of accounting, a little bit about technology, you're just automatically more uh, valuable than the people who only knew how to do the one skill for the job. So that, that would be an example of preparing you for all sorts of jobs that are better than the one you have. So one of the things I like to teach, and I call it a reframe, is that people think their job is what the boss told them their duties are. And I try to reframe that to tell you that your job is to get a better job. 
and, and in fact, that's what's good for the world as well as what's good for you. It's not great for your employer, who would like you to work for nothing forever, uh, but it's, it's what they would do to you. I mean, your employer mm-hmm. would fire you for any reason if it just made sense. You have the same right as an employee. So I tell people to just imagine that you're always trying to get a better job, even if you just got a new job. There's, there's no limit to it. Yeah, I think I think you're right on that. The other thing that I'd sort of just pick up on what you're talking about there is there's a lot of value in the in those soft skills that a lot of people overlook a lot of the time. So, I mean, I, I remember in one of the companies I was working with, I was a fairly young guy at the time, but um, we we, used, we had this management away day because we're looking to sort of refocus the company in, in, in a particular way. Um, and I was one of the younger guys there. And I, I remember at some point, somebody made the observation that all of the people in the room were basically the people who had the best um, social skills in the company, the best sort of persuasion skills and the best sort of communication skills. It was that sort of suite of other skills that kind of marked you out. And if you've got that, it kind of sets you up to be, you know, an effective communicator or leader or whatever it is. And, and, and th- those are a lot of the things that, that basically just get overlooked all the time. Yeah. Uh, let me give you a good example of that. I took a course many years ago on business writing, how to write in the business context. So you, you leave out your adjectives and you have, you know, short direct sentences and there's not much to it. It was about a I think it was a two half day class, but it completely changed my life because I immediately became the best communicator simply mm. because I took a class. And it also had direct application to becoming a cartoonist because uh, writing humor and writing for business turned out to be really, really similar in the sense that in both cases, you're trying to get directly to the point. You know, mm. <clears throat> if you're writing humor, you don't want big flowery sentences because you're trying to control the timing and the concentration and the focus of your audience. But a business writing is the same. So that's something that took half a day, two different days, and completely altered my trajectory. And that's a good idea of a system. Now, what makes that a system is that I worked for a big company. It was a phone company at the time. And they allowed us to take any class that made us more valuable. And they were very permissive about it. So you could do something outside of your field, something that was not directly related to your job, but maybe it would be someday. So they were very good at that. So my system was to just take every class that they offered because it was free to me. And the, a lot of them, like that one, was really super powerful. And then, then on my own, I learned to become a hypnotist. So I paid for a class and went at night. And uh, probably that plus the Dale Carnegie course, which was also something uh, the company offered, uh, were the two most valuable things that I could probably take those two skills. And then, you know, my background, I've got economics and business degrees. Yeah. I could take those skills into almost anywhere. They're, they're the most universally applicable things. Everybody needs somebody who knows business. Everybody needs a good communicator. Everybody needs somebody who's uh, persuasive, and you're you're seventy five so, to eighty percent done just with those three skills. So is is that what the hypnotism gave you? It was it was persuasion effectively. Yeah, per, hypnosis is a category within persuasion that would include everything from sales to marketing. But in my experience, because okay. I've taken taken classes and all the other things as well, uh, hypnosis was the one that was most directly applicable to everything. You, every situation, you can find a way to do it better if you understand how the brain works. And hypnosis is what taught me how brains work. Uh, uh, I'll give you a specific uh, example. Okay. Uh, well, one of the things you learn in hypnosis is that people only pretend to be rational, but in fact, we're irrational 90% of the time. And you know, 10% uh. of the time you're rational, like if you're trying to figure the shortest route to the grocery store. That's probably yeah. rational. But all of our big decisions, who do you marry, where do you live, what job do you take, we, we make the decision first and then our brain rationalizes why it made sense after the fact, after we've decided. So now, if you don't know that, the whole world looks backwards to you. But once you yeah. learn it, everything makes sense and you can operate in that world much more effectively. So is, is this the, the lizard brain and the prefrontal cortex? The lizard brain works on a basis of I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm afraid, I'm horny, what, whatever it is. And then the prefrontal cortex spends its whole time trying to keep the lizard brain happy and then trying to provide an explanation as to why the thing it did was actually from the prefrontal cortex in the first place. Is that essentially it? 
that, that that's pretty close. I I don't okay. think it's so much in terms of the real estate. It's but that's okay. essentially it. Yes. Uh, okay. Very cool. Um, the other thing that you talk about a lot on your show, in, and this probably gets more to the broken bit of, of brokenomics, is you look constantly at incentives. Um, wh- why the big focus on incentives? <laughs> well, I also have a saying that design is destiny. You mm. can look at the design of a system and you can pretty much predict what's going to happen because the incentives are set up a certain way. Um, yeah. For example... I was just talking this morning on my own podcast about the uh, the smash and grabs, all the, the mass robberies we're seeing. I think you're seeing them as well. We've where a bunch definitely of covered going, those, yeah. yeah. And, but if you look at the fact that the incentives for uh, robbery have increased because the penalties have decreased. So hmm. you'll get your bail. <clears throat> if you're with a group, you probably won't get caught at all. And um, you've also been taught if you're within a certain demographic in the United States, that there's an oppressor group and an oppressed group, and the oppressors have your stuff. <laughs> so if you're learning a CRT or DEI or ESG, which we call it over here, I'm not sure if, if the acronyms are the same, but <clears throat> they all teach the same thing, that there's the, the white, white people were the oppressors <clears throat> and black people were the oppressed. And that that effect has you know, continued across time, systemic racism. And that there's a, a reason that somebody has your stuff and mm. you, should, you should get it back. So if you were to say, Scott, I'm going to design a system and it has these, these characteristics, do you think that will have any effect on how people act? <laughs> and I would say, well, you, know, you might see a lot more robberies because people are trying to do exactly what you're teaching them, which is get their stuff back. Yeah. And you've reduced the penalties for doing so. Presumably, you get more of it. Uh, look, if you look at border security, if you let people into the country, uh, if they're coming here illegally, and say, "Well, maybe in seven years you can show back up in court, and you know, we'll talk about why you came in here in the first place," you're creating an incentive that guarantees massive immigration. And then you add to that that the cartel has a huge financial interest in making the immigration efficient, albeit illegal, you can pretty much guarantee what's going to happen. Uh, But weirdly, we have a situation in society where, for reasons I don't exactly understand, at least half of uh, America anyway, doesn't see the world in terms of incentives and penalties. And it's the only way I see the world. Because it does explain everything. And, And if you don't do that, you don't understand anything. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's let's start to pull pull some of that apart because there was something about the um, the, the border and the cartels. I understand why they have incentives for this. Um, it's less clear why the American voter or the American government might have a set of incentives behind that. So I, def- I definitely want to come back on that. But let's just let's just rewind to the um, the, the, the sort of um, undocumented shopping process that is going on in California and other parts of the U.S. at the moment. Um, right. You're right. It, it it tends to be a certain demographic. And there appears to be a level of um, racial animosity, which is, it feels like it's being pushed heavily in the United States. Now, so, so what's behind that undocumented shopping? Is it, could it be a different, um, different demographics have different um, behavioral characteristics? Probably true, but how you quantify that, I don't know. But certainly your, your other point about how there is um, a, a messaging being pushed, which is a sort of the victim and, and the oppressor thing, that is certainly true. Now, I'm, I've, I've experienced an example of that in, in a completely different setting, in a completely different demographic um, over COVID, for example. Um, people, I mean, because I, I never bought into any of that at any time. And so and that was very visible when the mask mandates came out. And I had people in my local area who um, previously, you know, would have been absolutely fine with me sort of turn on me and start treating me like the enemy for having done that. Now, if that can happen in the space of just a couple of months amongst people who I'm, you know, very homogeneous with, with just a little bit of government messaging, I start to wonder what would decades and decades of the same messaging produce? So, you know, what, what, what is, I mean, I, you, you can try and answer, you know, what's causing those differences that we see in behaviours between the demographic groups, if you like, or, you know, just, 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 just pick up on that last angle, which is why is there this um, massive push to create these essentially behavioural problems? 
<laughs> well, here, here again, hypnosis kind of makes everything clear, or at least the study of it. Yeah. People are most motivated. The, the number one thing that motivates people is not money. It's fear. So mm. you can't even talk about follow the money or the money predicts everything until everybody's safe or safe enough. And my en entire explanation of the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated and you know, the two sides that formed was it was what you were most afraid of. Now, nobody likes to hear this because we're all pretty sure that the other people were being irrational and we were being the smart ones, but hypnotists don't see it like that. We see two people who were not being the smart ones, but you were afraid of different things. And I'll put this in my own terms. Well, I, I, I was, I, my, my biggest concern was the government was getting far too much power and it was going to set a bad precedent. That was, that was my big concern. That you, you could say concern or could I say fear? Yeah, fine. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah. I, I, think so, the, so, I think history has given us cause to be concerned when governments get too much power. Right. So if I look at my own decisions, I said to myself, all right, there's this uh, virus that allegedly were, may have been weaponized and meant to kill people. Didn't know, still mm -hmm. don't know, but, but maybe it was designed to be extra killy, you know, and maybe it was designed to be extra lethal even in later years. So it's not even obvious at first. You don't know. But at the same time, there was this proposed solution of a vaccination that had many of the same qualities, which is what the hell is in here? Uh, I, I, I feel like they intended to be safe, but I don't know. And mm. then I look at my specific situation and I've got asthma and I'm over 60 and you know, the numbers look different for that group than they do for other groups. So I basically said, which, what is the scariest outcome? And I just did the other one. So in my specific case, I'm not super afraid of uh, needles, right? Mm. Needles don't bother me. If I were afraid of needles, I think I would have rationalized that it was a bad idea to get the shot. So you, you did because get... I'm not, I, I think if, if everything else had been the same, but the only thing different had been I personally had some fear of needles, because some people do. Uh, I just don't have that fear. So I think that I, I rationalized that I looked at all the risks and everything and made a decision. But the hypnotist in me knows that I just wasn't especially afraid of a shot, but I was a little bit afraid of uh, a bioweapon. And so I said to myself, I, I, can't, uh, I can't assess the risk of either one of these. So mm -hmm. I don't have data. I can't use data. So if you don't have data, how do you make a decision? And I literally picked the one that was least scary to me, but also gave me the most freedom in the short term. So one, one of the decision-making things that I use is, if you can't tell what the difference will be in the long term, well, at least do what makes sense in the short term, because you're just guessing about the rest. Okay, I, I, I wasn't so expecting the, to go here, but, but can, I, can I challenge on that? Because, I mean, I would say for me, it wasn't um, a fear of needles. It was more fear of um, um, in incompetence or, you know, products not being ready. So, I mean, we, we, we're all used to products coming out that, you know, right. maybe you know, the, the iPhone 11, I don't use iPhones. I'm sure the iPhone 11 is a fantastic product. The iPhone 1 or whatever came before that probably wasn't. You know, prototypes tend to, tend to be very buggy. And, and I guess what I was afraid of was the bugs in the system of a new technology. That was the concern rather, rather than the needles. So, um, so Eric, yeah. But, but, but everybody had that concern because even the experts, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had five years to test this? So mm -hmm. I don't think there was anybody who thought that a, you know, a brand new vaccination was necessarily safe and completely safe. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I say fear of needles... That doesn't apply to necessarily you or anybody else, any specific person. I'm just saying that my, my bag of fears might be a little different than your bag of fears, but the bag of fears will completely predict which way we go, and then afterwards okay. we'll rationalize that we were smart. Well, am, am, am I allowed to ask if, you have, if you're up to date on your boosters? Uh, I got the first two, you know, the original okay. two that you had to do in a pair. And that was during um, the Alpha uh, variant. Yeah. And uh, after after we hit Omicron, vaccinations didn't make any sense. Okay. So, so um, I got the two. 
I mean, is that to say that your fear of, of, of bugs in the technology then outweighed your fear of, um, what, potential bioweapon? Yeah, because once, it, once we had Omicron, it looked like it had evolved into something safer. But again, I, I suppose there's some possibility the bioweapon could survive the evolution as well. But all the indications were it was far less deadly, closer to a common cold. And at that point, the risk of the vaccination seemed to outweigh the risk of the uh, COVID. But again, le- even though I said that in a way that sounded rational, oh, the risk of this is greater than the risk of that. I don't know what the risk of either of those things are, right? Mm. I really don't. So how did, I, how did I make that sound like I was making a rational decision? Nobody was. <laughs> so, so, the, the so, so to come back to my yeah. earlier point, is, is that to say that the, the, the lizard brain made its decision and then ev- everything that you've just told me is essentially the, the frontal cortex, you know, trying to, trying to rationalize it, the same as perhaps I would have done? Right. And then we fight with each other about which of our rationalizations was the good one. That, that's how it works. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's the incentive at the individual level. Did you also look at, um, you know, taking that incentivization process up a level to what were the incentives for the pharma companies, what were the incentives for the media companies, what were the incentives for government? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was clear that the uh, pharma had an incentive to put it out whether it was 100% effective or not. Mm. So that's true. And it's true that the politicians had an incentive to claim they were doing something um, and once, once big money was involved, things were going to go in the direction of the big money. Uh, as, long, as long as they had us sufficiently frightened that enough of us were going to get the shots, then the money was the, the predictor after that. Okay, so, the, so essentially the power systems were operating on a, um, a money-first principle and the population was working on a fear per first principle. Is that, is that kind of right? Um, I, I'm, I'm uh, processing that and I think that's a brilliant observation. Yes, I think you're right. I had not thought of it that way, but that's, that summarizes it quite well, I think. Okay. Does that ever apply to anything else? I mean, let, let's say, for example, um, I don't know, there were to be a, a, a war in some random part of Europe, for example. Is, is, it, is, it, is it possible that there are financial interests for um, government level players and, I don't know, people who, people who make stuff that, that goes bang, um, and they would sell that to the public in a, in a, in a fear-based narrative? You know, if, if we don't do this, there's going to be a new, um, you know, Nazi horde spreading across the world, that kind of thing. Could, could that happen? <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose something wild like that could happen in, in our world. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's pretty much an exact uh, description of Ukraine. <laughs> yes, and actually, come to think of it, global warming and whatever the next thing is as well. In fact, where do you come down on where do you come down on that? On climate change. Yeah. Um, uh, my, so I used to do uh, financial predictions. That was part of my work mm. when I worked for corporations. And anybody who's done that kind of work, where they're trying to predict anything three to you know, more years in the future, we all know it's garbage. And we all know that our, <laughs> our, we, we all yes. know that our outcomes are entirely determined by our assumptions, and the assumptions are entirely determined by what we yes. want the outcomes to be. <laughs> we, we just manufacture the outcomes for our bosses. And you know, once in a while, there's something so wildly wrong that maybe the numbers will catch it. But mostly, you're, you're justifying what you already wanted to do. So when I look at the models, uh, I realize that there's a huge difference between somebody who's scientifically literate and somebody who is uh, statistically literate <laughs> or understands how models work. <laughs> because it's not mm. science. And it's not even close. It's, it's the way to market science. So it's like uh, comparing the science to the marketing of science. Marketing is bullshit by by design. So here, here's, what the, uh, here's what the models don't do. They do not pick up any, uh, any kind of technical innovation. Mm. Uh, and that's going to be the biggest story. You know, if we're, when we're looking back at it from, let's say, 30 years from now, the story of that 30 years will be the things we invented in those 30 years. For example, 
uh, modular small nuclear reactors, generation four, the kind that don't have any risk of melting down and actually can use the fuel, the spent fuel, instead of you know storing it, you can actually eat it if you're a Gen 4 reactor. So the, that sort of thing, which is an advanced development right now. And then there are also uh, new battery types being developed that wouldn't use rare, rare earth materials and have much more density and they're lighter and, and all that stuff. So those are the things that are gonna make um, the future. And those are not part of any of the models. You know, the, the models are straight line projections. Now here's the thing that people don't understand about models. <laughs> And if you're not like, you know, immersed in that world, none of this would be obvious. And I don't think it's obvious even to the scientists. And it goes like this. Let's say on day one, a uh, hundred people make predictions and they're all over the place. So you say to yourself, well, we'll watch these predictions for a couple of years and see if which ones are good. So after a few years, you throw away some of them because they just didn't work, didn't even work for three years. But the ones that did work for three years, you keep. And then there's a few that were close, and you say, well, if I tweaked a variable, I could get this to where it would have worked for those three years that have already passed. It's called the Hein casting. So it's like predicting the past. You know, and it's something you'd want to do to make sure your model is good, but it doesn't really tell you it's going to predict the future. It feels like it, but it, but it isn't that. So you keep going, and eventually um, all the bad models have disappeared because you say, well, they didn't work. So we'll get rid of these. And you're left with a little batch that have a narrow range. And you say to yourself, all right, these are the good models, and the good models are all in this range, so therefore we've used science to predict the future. Nothing like that happened. <laughs> what happened was you threw away the models that didn't work. Because basically you've you just described survivor bias, haven't you? That, that, that's the exact word for it, it's survivorship bias. And so some, some models will be right, but that's guaranteed by the fact that there were a lot of them. And it's guaranteed yeah. further by the fact that the ones you have are going to get tweaked as you go to make them better fit the past. And then the illusion is yes. that making sure they fit the past tells you something about the future, and it just doesn't. It just doesn't. So, so I, I certainly so, have put together lots of financial models over the years. And, you know, you, what ends up happening is you end up taking them to your boss and he will say something like, oh, I, I was kind of expecting it to show this. And you're like, well, that's fine. I'll just go and tweak the assumptions until it shows that then. It just doesn't bother me. It get, yeah, gets you to where, yeah. to where you want. People who don't do financial forecasting don't know how easy it is to tweak an assumption. Hmm. You, you could go to any one of your, like, six major assumptions and just dial it up or dial it down in a completely yeah. defendable way. Okay. Completely different. The thing outcome. is, you can, you, can, you can jump that on, on this one, and you could just, uh, say, let, let, let's stick with financial institutions, so banks, for example. Um, most of these big banks are sponsoring some form of climate evangelism, or they're, they're sponsoring some organization, or they're, they're putting some sort of money out onto this. So on one hand, they've got money that's flowing out the show that they back it, and they tend to publicize that kind of thing. On the other hand, they're giving 35, 50-year mortgages on properties which their own sponsored models imply are going to be underwater within 12 years. Now, the amount of money on the second side is larger than the amount of money on the first side. So you've got to assume that, you know, hedging the bets here, um, they think it's bullshit. Well, uh, let me push back on that. Uh, so okay. uh, I'll just test what you're saying. You're, you're saying, for example, the rich people who believe in climate change are also buying property on the beach. Is that, is that no, close I'm, to I'm what saying, you're saying? No, I'm saying the, the banks that make donations to climate-based organisations in order to do the modelling are also typically lending 50-year um, mortgages on properties which those models suggest are going to be imperiled by the models right. that they're funding in the other part of the organisation. But the, the things that they are uh, doing loans to are, are rich people on the beach, right? You're talking mm. about rich people. And I have to explain this to people all the time, that rich people don't think like the rest of you. <laughs> it, <laughs> if you gave me a billion dollars, which I don't have, I would build on the beach no matter what I thought about climate change. Because if my house got yes, washed away, I'd just buy another one. I'd just buy another one. Or yeah. if it went down 50% in value, I'd say, well, I didn't even notice. But I sure enjoyed my time at the beach. So you can't look at um, investment that primarily is involving rich people who have really nothing to lose. 
uh, with anybody else. So that's a little bit misleading, I think. Fair point. Okay. Um, so we, we, went, we went down a bit of a, a, a sideways thing there with COVID and, 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 and climate. That's fine. Let, let's just circle back to the... Um, um, to the to racial animosity thing, because I'm, I don't think I'm wrong, is there? There is there is a there is a concerted agenda in the US, and this spills over to the UK as well, but to a lesser. But it's very much focused around the US of of whipping up racial animosity. Have I got that wrong? And and who's who's incentivized to do that? And why is that happening? Well, there's a whole industry of people who work in, like I mentioned, DEI and ESG and. There are people who write books and give lectures and pundits. So we've uh, monetized uh, a certain form of uh, grievance and anything monetized you're going to get more of. So as long as there's an incentive for people to enter that industry, and you know, the Ibram Kendi's and uh, you can think of several other names, as long as it pays, there's going to be more of it. So I don't know how you... Uh, I don't, the, you can easily predict there'll just be more of it because there, there's money in it. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.